Good morning, uh, afternoon, evening, depending on where you are and joining us. Uh, welcome to uh, a Data for Good speaking series uh, featuring um, Sarita Shainabek. Am I pronouncing that right? Yep. Shainabek, um, who's uh, will speaking with us today about building just technologies in an unjust world. And I am thrilled to, to have you and um, uh, glad that you were able to join us. So Sarita is uh, an associate professor in the School of Information at the University of Michigan, where she directs the Living Online Lab and co-directs the Social Media Research Lab. She's also a member of the Michigan Interactive and Social Compute Computing Group um, and has focused on social media, human computer, inter computer interaction, and social computing in her research, uh, where she broadly addresses equity and justice in online environments. Um, Thank you so much for joining us, Sarita, um, and I'll let you take it and we'll have time for Q&A at the end. Great, thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you, Courtney, for the invitation. So the title of my talk is Building Just Technologies in an Unjust World. And there are accessible slides for this talk um, available for anyone who wants them at, um, on our website, yardy.people.si.umich.edu forward slash capital Columbia 2020.pdf. So you can follow along there if you'd like to. So this talk will be a provocation about the state of computing now and imagining what the future of computing could be. To set the stage, I'm gonna share a little bit about myself. My undergraduate degree was in computer engineering. It was at Dartmouth College, which is a liberal arts college. And at the time I struggled to do the liberal arts side of it. I enjoyed problem sets and numbers, but I couldn't get past a B in my sociology 101 class. And then as I moved into the fields of information and human-centered computing, we learned to embrace um, centering people in computing, but it still required years for me to learn how to write a paper and even longer to think about how to center justice within the work I was doing. So this talk is a reflection and an invitation for all of us to think about the role of justice in computing. So society is unjust. Many people have experienced these injustices their entire lives, and others are feeling them more acutely now. Climates are overheated, poverty is widespread, racism is pernicious and also widespread, democracy is under attack. Computing has always embraced optimism, and this is an optimism I share, but we're also seeing how computing can mirror and magnify injustices. So Bitcoin and GPT-3 consume massive amounts of energy. Children's access to technology or lack of it, which is especially heightened now during the pandemic, it can widen economic inequalities rather than erasing them. Facial recognition technology misidentifies people of color, and even if it works as intended, is often used for harmful policing and other activities. And Twitter and Facebook have a somewhat uncontrolled outbreak of misinformation that threatens our very democracy. So to address these challenges, computing needs to take on the social and moral imperative to build just and equitable technologies. I believe we will and need to experience a new paradigm shift in the field. The paradigm shift will be what I'm gonna propose we can call critical computing. And critical computing is a field that embraces the opportunity and excitement of computing, but also recognizes the potential harms, inequities, injustices, and traumas that computing can perpetuate. It imagines a future where potential benefits and potential harms are centered in what we decide to build. So critical computing is a epistemology or way of thinking about the world. And it's optimistic, not necessarily about where we are now, but where we could be. So why do we need computing and why now? Look at industry. So Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft are um, regularly accused of monopolistic practices, privacy violations, and failing to protect users. I attended a panel yesterday at the Association of Internet Researchers that discussed the many trade-offs academic researchers, um, like myself and many of you, need to make in deciding who we take money from, under what conditions, and for what purposes. Many of us still partner with them, um, accept their money, and send our students to work there, as I do, but we may not do so quite so loudly or proudly as we did 10 or 15 years ago. A critical computing perspective centers harms and injustices, as well as opportunities and benefits in shaping what technology should be developed and pushed onto consumers. 
And we can also look at institutional diversity in both academia and industry. So there's ongoing attention to the lack of equitable representation and participation in computing. And it may be improving, but it's a slow trickle and there's still widespread injustices that are often rendered invisible to those who are not directly experiencing them. My colleagues um, wrote a paper about the lack of diversity, especially uh, racial diversity in my own discipline, HCI, the Human Computer Interaction. And they note in their paper that ours is a pipeline whose valve the community itself controls. So while they're speaking to an HCI audience, it applies to much of academia. And a critical computing perspective takes on the responsibility of addressing in inequities as our own responsibility. And finally, look at scholarship. We're seeing heightened attention to concepts like responsibility, trustworthiness, ethics, and fairness. And that's where I want to focus my provocations for today. Fairness is a compelling starting point for embedding moral and equitable principles in the models and systems we build. However, scholars are increasingly pointing out the challenges with fairness. Anna Lauren Hoffman, for example, has highlighted how fairness overemphasizes individual fault instead of systematic injustices. Ben Green has similarly pointed out that many issues like risk assessment may have less to do with fairness or accuracy and more to do with how the criminal justice system should be structured. Radia Abebe and colleagues have said that the technical work treats problematic features of the status quo as fixed, but fails to address deeper patterns of injustice and inequality. My colleagues Abby Jacobs and Hannah Wallach have called attention to the challenges of measuring unobservable theoretical constructs, like what is trustworthiness? And my own work uh, recently has suggested that fairness focuses on following existing rules rather than remediating harms. So collectively, these lines of critique arise because we're not trying to apply fairness principles on systems that are fundamentally unjust. Applying fairness to them may allow us to minimize furthering injustices, but it doesn't get at the root of those injustices. Fairness also relies on principles of neutrality and objectivity, but computing is not neutral and neither are its researchers. It can be tempting to think I'm just an engineer or I have built the systems and to leave questions of values to others. But computing is not neutral. And to make that case, I'm gonna to turn to the field of archival studies. So you might say, well, what does archival studies have to do with computing or data science in relevant areas? And I'm gonna say both are related to the practices associated with the record keeping of societal knowledge. Archival studies refers to the theory and practice of creating and curating collections of documents and other kinds of records. Um, examples of archives are the Library of Alexandria, the Library of Congress, the Smithsonian, and your own university archives at Columbia. And so this is the parallel I want to draw out. Early archival theory, up until the 20th century, generally treated archives as objective and neutral, just like many would say computing is. Back then, archivists were considered passive curators of evidence, and the intent of an archive was to preserve an objective truth. More recently, though, postmodern archival theory now recognizes archives and archivists as subjective curators of knowledge with immense power to shape what is preserved, how it's preserved, and for how long. And as a result, archivists have a cultural and professional responsibility to preserve a public good and to create public goods. Archival scholars work to decolonize archives and they're suspicious of records assembled by governments and institutions that historically have silenced oppressed voices, such as Native American materials in US archives or South African apartheid, or 1970s Cambodian genocide, which is reflected here in the background photo. So what archival theory brings to computing is a centuries long recognition that there's no such thing as being neutral about what we build, what data we collect, or what we decide to do with it. Therefore, we need to take on the cultural and professional mandate to preserve a public good. We we'll argue that fairness has limitations in its ability to address injustices and that technologies and their developers are neither neutral nor objective. But the point is not that these are useless or wrong. They're, of course, immensely important. Fairness seems to be the best tool we have to align with things like anti-discrimination laws. Neutrality and objectivity are important frameworks for recognizing our own biases. And so I like to think of them as tools in a toolkit. And we need a wide range of tools depending on what problems we are addressing. And I'd like to focus on expanding justice as part of this toolkit. Many of the critiques of fairness that are growing in computing, in uh, machine learning, and AI fields align with the growing parallel movement towards justice. 
However, I hear less among critiques of fairness about how to build more just systems. So that's what I want to explore with you now and, and try to make some arguments about. I'm going to turn to my research on online harassment, uh, which has been one of my major research areas in recent years, to explore ways of moving beyond neutrality, objectivity, and fairness and towards um, ideas about justice. So when I refer to online harassment, I'm including a wide range of behaviors like hate speech, um, offensive speech, doxing, which refers to posting a home address publicly, spreading rumors, purposeful embarrassment, posting insults, um, sharing of unsolicited photos, often of a sexual nature, non-consensual sharing of sexual photos, etc. About almost half, about 40% of internet users have experienced online harassment, so this is widespread. And it dis disproportionately harms um, some demographics, like women, people of color, LGBTQ people, and people at the intersections of those identities. So here's a pipeline for what happens if someone harasses someone else. This is a pipeline I put together, and so I'm um, happy to reflect on it. I'd love to keep iterating on it. Um, the harassment is processed only if it triggers an automated flag to try to infer, say, toxicity scores, such as Google's Perspective API, which tries to identify toxic um, content, or Twitter's conversational health metrics, which try to do something similar, and then they flag or remove the content depending on the violation. If harassment is manually reported, either by someone who is targeted by the harassment or by someone, a friend who's observing it or a bystander, reporters are asked to select what category of content it is. And so this can be, is it spam, is it hate speech, et cetera. And then it goes into a processing pipeline where content moderators decide whether it violates community guidelines or not. And content moderators are typically low wage workers. They're often outside of the US. Um, they're expected to process complex reports very quickly. Um, our colleague Sarah Roberts has written a book behind the screen about this that goes into a lot of detail, which I, I recommend if you're interested. And so what happens is if these content moderators decide that the content um, violates the site's community guidelines, the content is usually removed. The offender will be notified of some action, and depending on the extremity of the, con of the harassment, it could be that they receive a warning, they could receive a temporary ban, or they could be banned entirely. Um, and the reporter notifies, is notified of some action as well. If it doesn't violate guidelines, nothing happens. And a commitment to fairness is embedded in this process. So if content violates guidelines, it's removed. If it doesn't, it's not. That's it. That's all that happens. And I'm arguing that this is a far cry from justice. Let me give you two recent examples. Emily Oster is an economist at Brown University, and she's been doing a lot of empirical research in the recent months about um, school closings and um, health, public health implications. And she has suggested, based on her, her group's data and their analyses, that reopening schools may be safe for children. Uh, but she's been harassed on Twitter and other, um, in other mediums for these arguments. So for example, one person writes um, in reply to her, what the fuck is wrong with you? You have no ground talking about the reopening of school. Your education of an economist gives you no right to speak of infectious disease. NPR, you should be ashamed. In another example, um, Uche Blackstock is a doctor who studies racism in healthcare and I believe is based in New York City. Um, and she's also spoken out quite a lot about um, the pandemic and COVID and its differential impacts on people of color and on black people. Um, and she has also described the ex uh, extensive harassment she's experienced. So I'm gonna read what she posted here on Twitter um, a few weeks ago. After three appearances on NBC and CNN yesterday, I woke up to this in my inbox. I debated whether I should share it publicly and then I decided that I should because I didn't want to carry that burden. It's a message from someone written to her. It says, kill yourself. All you dumb N-words are going to be worthless N-words in a concentration camp when Trump, Trump steals the election again. Ha ha, N-word lives don't matter. We're going to get revenge for every time you insulted a white person or condescended to us. Literally the end of America. N-word are gonna get gassed. And so you can take down this harassment 
maybe that's fair. That's what sites would do now. But is that justice in any way? Does that remediate harms that are experienced and shared? So if we go back to our model, the actions taken are that the content is removed and the offender may be warned or banned. And I frame these as approaches that mirror criminal justice models because they rely on punitive approaches that remove people from society, but with little opportunity for rehabilitation or reconciliation. And so banning users does not teach them how to behave better. There's few mechanisms for holding people accountable online. It's really hard to enforce punishments. If you try to remove someone from Twitter or Reddit, they can just create a new account and do it again. There's no incentive to behave better. And it's harmful because the criminal justice system is violent and discriminatory towards people of color and people with disabilities. So removing content, removing people with no effort at rehabilitation or mediation, it's probably not a model we want to follow. So when I think about alternative theories and ways um, of approaching justice, I'm inspired by some colleagues who've been speaking out about this um, in recent years. So uh, Safiya Noble has written about Google and search engine, and she says, search engine, result, search engine results perpetuate narratives that reflect historically uneven distributions of power in society. And Ruha Benjamin says, race neutrality, it turns out, is a deadly force. And Sasha Kostanja Chak has said, within any decision-making system, what distribution of benefits do we believe is just? And theories of racial justice acknowledge the systematic injustices and inequities communities of color have experienced, the lack of access to employment, education, housing, and other rights. And most views towards racial justice advocate for deliberative systems and support to remote, promote racial equity, rather than simply removing discrimination as a fairness approach that sites use now might have. Proponents of reparations have also called attention to long legacies of trauma and grief across generations. And so Sasha Constanja Chalk has, has asked in their Design Justin's book, instead of algorithmic fairness, what if we had algorithmic reparations? And that's what I'd like to uh, consider, and that's a provocation, is what would a repar reparative justice approach look like? It might ask us to acknowledge historical harms and commit to repairing them. In one project, my colleagues and I have been studying the relationships between online harassment and experiences of harm. And in a series of online experiments we've conducted, we find that repeated harassment, so people who are harassed repeatedly, routinely, is perceived as significantly greater in harm than one-time harassment, which may not be so surprising. We also find that some kinds of harassment, like sharing sexually explicit photos or doxing people, are related to higher perceptions of sexual and physical harm, respectively. So the question I have is, what, could, what if we could build past harms into our models and then try to repair them as a form of justice? And if we go back to our toolbox metaphor, so we can consider racial and reparative justice as one framework or a set of frameworks, another framework I'd like to surface is restorative justice. Restorative justice is an alternative approach to the criminal justice process that has been used in prisons and schools and other contexts. Restorative justice is concerned with mediation processes that mend conflict between an offender, a victim, and the community, often with the involvement of facilitators. This approach has been um, written about, supported by Archbishop Bishop Desmond Tutu, who says, the central concern is not retribution and punishment but in the spirit of Ubuntu, the healing of breaches, the redressing of imbalances, the restoration of broken relationships. Restorative justice is being served when efforts are being made to work for healing, for forgiveness, and for reconciliation. And restorative justice has been used in indigenous cultures in the US and Canada, Cameroon, and other um, African countries, in Australia and elsewhere. And just one example here, it was used as the foundation for a 1989 act between the Maori people in New Zealand and the New Zealand parliament. And in that context, it was designed to care for indigenous children rather than moving them into prison pipelines. And a central tenet for restorative justice is that it asks offenders to acknowledge wrongdoing and harm, accept responsibility for their actions, and express remorse. And restorative justice is, um, is a kind of a growing phenomenon. So here at the University of Michigan, for example, our Office of Conflict Resolution now uses, um, or is, is trying to use, 
a concept called restorative justice circles. And those, um, as they say, provide an opportunity for community members to come together to address harmful behavior in a process that explores harms and needs, obligations, and necessary engagement. So we're even seeing this restorative justice approach um, playing out or, or being um, explored in college campus contexts. And so I'm going to tell you about a study that we published er earlier this year where we explored how to translate varied alternative justice theories and the standard criminal justice theory into responses that social media sites could take after online harassment. So we asked participants about existing criminal justice approaches, like banning users and removing content. Then we also asked them uh, what they thought about novel approaches. So one we proposed um, to them is an offender list. And this invokes a public shaming kind of vigilante justice approach. Um, we also asked about payment, which aligns with a reparation kind of framework. So if someone is harassed, is payment something that would feel like justice was restored to them? We asked about apologies. There's an immense amount of literature about um, apologies as an approach to repair harms and express remorse. Um, and that's also aligned with both um, reparation and restorative justice. And then we proposed other ideas like mediation, which was, um, draws from restorative justice principles where people, um, specifically offenders and uh, victims or targets, come together with a mediator to discuss the experience. And then we explored um, educating people about identities, which draws from a social justice kind of approach. And then a few others like giving people their own spaces to, to gather online. Um, and then increasing or decreasing privacy levels via exposure. So on sites like Instagram, for example, having more exposure might be something that feels like um, a repair of harm someone experienced, um, or less exposure. If you've been harassed, maybe you want fewer people to have access to you on a site like Twitter, for example, getting in your mentions. So we conducted a um, study where we asked a range of participants and we were intentional about um, including a diverse um, set of participants along gender, race, and other um, dimensions. Because we wanted to know what would feel like justice to them and what would be desirable for them when they experience um, or if they experience online harassment. So um, the paper is available online if you'd like to take a look at the, the details, but I'm gonna show just one result that gives an indication of what people's preferences were. So what we see here is um, banning is the most um, preferred response, resp uh, kind of justice when people are harassed online. After that, the next three um, are an apology from an offender, an offender list, and removing content. And these three are fascinating to me, um, especially the apology and the offender list, because they um, invoke these very alternative theories about what does justice look like online? So it's not just banning and removing, but something like an apology from an offender. You know, what would that look like? Um, always, it's intriguing to me that as for as children, we learn to apologize to other kids, and it's kind of um, baked into what we're supposed to do when when we harm another child. And then as adults, it's apologies and acknowledgement of harm and remorse are pretty removed from how we interact with each other. Perhaps now um, at this moment in time, more than ever. And so it's a, to me, a compelling dimension to explore when we think about what does justice look like online. So if we go back to our model, we might think about how can we build reparation into it? For example, if someone is repeatedly harassed, why do we continue to treat them the same as someone who hasn't been harassed? So for example, if we um, are using automated methods to detect um, harassment or toxic speech or unhealthy conversations or abuse. Right now, sites just take this fairness approach where they only look at the content removed from any sort of context and say, should we remove it or not? But what if we looked at, well, who is targeted by this harassment? What kinds of harm might this harassment cause them? What prior experiences of harm have they had or prior experiences of harassment? And can we build those into our models when we think about what does justice look like for them? We might also think about spaces where we can build in justice. So apologies, uh, maybe things like payment, 
or other kinds of reparation which can uh, offer acknowledgement of wrongdoing, a commitment to making amends and expression of remorse. Currently, targets of harassment have no place in this entire model. So if they're targeted, um, they don't receive any acknowledgement of the harm that they experience or the offense that they experience is not built into the site and there's no mechanism for the site to, to interact with them. And so what I'm proposing is there, we should be considering who's harmed and how we can build that into how sites think about more just experiences online. And these are interdisciplinary suggestions. It allows to bring justice theories into both HCI and machine learning practices and probably other fields as well. So for example, within HCI, when we think about the reporting process, um, it requires either the person who's targeted or bystanders to describe what, what happened and how it happened. And right now it just means filling in some categories, but we can think about what would be a process that allows them to um, experience justice, to share, say, harms or traumas they've experienced. And this is a very HCI question. It requires talking to people and understanding what does harm mean for them right? and how would justice uh, look after they've experienced. But it can also be automated with machine learning, for example. We might ask, well, what does formalizing harm look like? That's not been done. There's very little theorizing about harm um, in most fields, especially in computing. And what does it mean to formalize it? And we should center the question when we're studying formalizing harm, what are the potential benefits and increases in harm if we try to formalize these concept, uh, complex concepts? And one consistent theme, for example, across our studies um, reveals how a one-size-fits-all approach to online harassment may fail to support some users while privileging others. For example, in our study, women reported greater harms associated with repeated harassment, which may not be surprising to anyone who spent any time on the internet. Uh, transgender participants in our study were less likely to find the idea of an apology desirable, and that might be because an ingenuine apology would be more harmful to them and might magnify discriminations those groups experience. And while banning users, for example, is a popular, the most popular preference among participants overall, um, among our sample, American Indian and Alaskan Native participants considered banning users undesirable. And this may reflect this group's cultural preference for restorative um, rather than retributive justice. As I mentioned, restorative justice has roots in many indigenous cultures. And it may reflect other aspects like historical experiences of being removed from their own lands, or even their recent experiences of uh, being banned from Facebook, removed from Facebook because of Facebook's um, real name policy. So I'm going to bring it back to the broader theme of the talk now. And I argued against the idea that technologies are neutral or objective, or that the people who build them can be neutral or objective. So while fairness is an important starting point, and principles like group fairness can move the needle towards acknowledging injustices, it may not address underlying societal problems. And this is where I argue that a critical computing perspective that focuses on experiences of harm as well as addressing injustices can be powerful. So we can apply this critical computing approach to classes that we teach, for example. And I'm gonna focus on ethics for a minute in this conversation. Ethics should not be relegated to a single class or module, especially in computing curricula, which is kind of a standard approach right now. It should be weaved throughout most or all courses. And I'm also gonna argue that we should move beyond ethics or ethics itself should move beyond philosophical formalisms and should consider other epistemologies drawing from the social sciences, humanities, and other fields. A critical computing approach um, would draw likely closely from science and technology studies or STS which examines the political, social, and cultural relationships between technologies and society. And I'm excited by um, some expanding cross-disciplinary movements to do this kind of work. And it's not just in HCI or AI and ML or in STS. For example, Sandy Kamara at Brown CS um, gave this really beautiful keynote where he links cryptography to uh, social justice issues in, um, in his recent keynote. And for example, he says, we want new research agendas and new technologies that address problems that we know are experienced by marginalized groups. And in his talk, he links these justice issues to ideas like databases and cryptography. 
So I think there's a lot of promise um, for cross-disciplinary movements towards critical approaches to computing. And in my own teaching, um, I taught an algorithms in society class uh, last semester, and I'll teach it again next semester. And I wanted to mention just one story from that class. So early in the class, um, back in January, I was teaching students about predictors in a regression model. And to give an example in the class, I asked students what factors might predict who will graduate from Washtenaw Community College or not. And WCC is a local community college just a few miles down the road from the University of Michigan here in Ann Arbor. My prediction was that women are more likely to drop out of Washtenaw Community College because childcare and other domestic demands are often inequitably relegated to women. A student in my class, Lupe Gonzalez, um, who, and who gave permission for me to tell the story here, is a Hispanic man and he felt that men might be more likely to drop out because there's a strong cultural expectation of providing for the family that would make having a job and income more pressing. And examples like these are important reminders that we need to talk with people who are affected by the tools we build. We need to remember that behind every data point is a person with a story. And when the pandemic started in March and students started losing their part-time jobs or internship offers, I decided to try to hire some of the students from my class, my Algorithms and Society class. I'd redirected NSF funds, uh, National Science Foundation funds, that I had to hire them in paid research assistant positions to create online educational videos about bias and discrimination in algorithms. And so um, from the screenshot, you can see, and these are available on YouTube. We haven't posted them publicly yet, but um, I can share the link. They, the students themselves oversaw this entire project. Um, and they created these videos, for example, about voting and politics and how um, news feeds like Facebook news feeds can perpetuate biases in um, what kinds of political content people see. They talked about marketing and advertising and how those can be um, biased based on gender and race and other identities. Um, they defined key terms. And they talked about bias in search algorithms, for example, drawn closely from Safia Noble's work um, on Google. And so this was an example where they were able to take ownership over this project and create these animations themselves and um, the scripts and everything else, and they narrated them. And it's a really exciting project that um, um, we're fleshing out now. So right now we're creating teacher lesson plans and student guides, and then we will hopefully start sharing it publicly soon with the idea that high school teachers or introductory college courses or just anyone in the general public could use these if they want to learn about um, bias and discrimination in algorithms, for example. And so to bring it back to the concept of critical com computing, it's not just a research focus or a discipline that I'm proposing. It's also about what classes we teach and how we teach them. And it can be about caring for others and training and engaging um, diverse young students who bring wisdom and new perspectives to technology. And so with that, I'm going to um, conclude. I'd like to thank the UMSI staff who make um, their research possible, collaborators and research assistants, and um, also acknowledge and disclose sources of financial support, which include the NSF, Twitter, Mozilla, Instagram, Facebook, and the Knight Foundation. And I'm going to open it up for questions now. And I kept this um, so much short. I wanted to keep the provocations um, concise. That's also a Friday afternoon. I know we've, most people have been attending a lot of Zoom talks. So I'd love to discuss these ideas and um, talk about what resonates, what do people agree with or not agree with. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing slides and we can move to discussion. Thank you, Dr. Shana Beck. That was that was uh, fascinating. Uh, thank you for sharing your your work. Uh, we have a uh, one question that that's in now, but I'd, I'd like to start first to ask you to share a little bit more about your own journey. So, you know, starting off in computer science, um, your work now is really questioning some fundamental principles about your your home discipline, at least your your first discipline. Um, I guess it started with your transition into HCI. So. Could you speak a little bit more about that transition, um, how you got there, sort of maybe what were some of the catalysts for you moving in this direction? And I ask this because I've been having 
uh, lots of conversations with computer scientists in particular, including those here at Columbia who are increasingly moving in this direction, away from some perception of neutral into actively engaging issues of justice. And I think um, our audience might benefit from, from knowing more about your journey. Yeah, so as I hinted at um, early on, my undergraduate degree was in computer engineering and I, um, you know, high school and moving through that time, I liked problem sets. I found that like doable and answerable and, you know, it's probably just better at those than thinking about social issues, you know, which now, of course, maybe is less intuitive that that would have been kind of where I started from. Um, in Dartmouth, as a, for both engineering, especially more engineering than computer science, it was relative, um, relatively pretty good in some ways about kind of gender diversity, for example. And so I felt pretty good being a woman in engineering, like there weren't that many women faculty, but I kind of felt like this is like a progressive place and this is, you know, this, this feel, I'm safe here and comfortable here. Um, and as I reflect back now, and, and it still was, but it was also a very narrow focus on gender and on very, uh, very few other kinds of dimensions. And so that's both my own reflection, but I think that's also a reflection of the field. Um, and this is, you know, not a new or not a surprising statement for most people when we think about computing and what does diversity look like for decades now. It's been about women in computing. And I think the beneficiaries have been a, a narrow view of like white women mostly, and that's kind of who's moved through the field. So that's something that, um, and, and, as we think about kind of reflexivity, even learning to do that is not always intuitive. So for my own background, um, my parents are both immigrants and I'm half Indian and half Australian, which is like, you look at me, I look white. So you think like, I should be kind of attuned to these things and you know, like half my entire family is all Indian. And, um, but but it, I, you know, I, I raised that, I think thinking about trajectories is important because it's, it's not, I don't want to say it's okay to get things wrong, but once things aren't as you kind of learning to adapt and acknowledge, well, how I saw things in the past, how we see things in the past, we can still improve now and kind of own that and move forward. So, um, and we might even, if we think like our own views are kind of progressive, or, you know, there's, there's always spots where we're not sensitive to other people's experiences. So I think that was an important kind of progression. Um, and then even still, you know, studying topics that reflect other people's experiences and identities is a challenge. I think it's really hard to know when to do that or not, and that's still something I struggle with. So I can write about just my own narrow worldview, which is like this, you know, um, background of looking white and being mixed race, but like, what does that mean? Can I speak to anyone else's experiences? And I think that's a challenge. Um, collaborations where that are kind of interdisciplinary and also bringing multiple experiences and perspectives are one way to kind of navigate that and feel like you're allowing people's voices to be heard um, and also bringing in students who can who can um, expand the kinds of research we do is really important so and so even through my PhD there's work I, I did where I now regret it and wish I'd done it differently because I wasn't sensitive to other people's experiences working centering those people's voices and so I think one thing that that's helped me focus on is the, so the idea of like an apology. I think that as we think about as computing moves into these like you know trying to do diversity do these other spaces, I think a, a major concern is people are going to just kind of brute force it and like just think we're being diverse because we're studying a diverse topic. You know whether in that what does it even mean? That doesn't make sense, but that's how it might be portrayed. Um, without recognizing the harms that are magnified and I think that's a major concern um, and part of that is ability to reflect on that when people kind of call that out like create spaces where people can call out those um, those harms so there's a little bit um, long went or all over the place because I think these are hard discussions to work through but really important to do it is and I think that's you know part of what's so important to acknowledge that um, you know, even your own insights now took a lot of work, you know, personal work and professional work to get to a place where you can integrate this into your practice and really just highlighting where this is not necessarily where you started and it's not something that um, came easily. And I think it's important, you know, for people to understand that more so than 
even more so than, um, you know, well-crafted positions on an issue that took a lot of work to get to. And that sort of the underbelly of that, I think, is also um, important. I'm going to turn to um, some questions from the audience. So the first is from William Frey, who says, thank you so much for your talk. Your recent work seems to be considering a somewhat individualized understanding of justice, as harm online is often caused at not only the individual levels, but also beyond. Are there collective, communal, institutional, and or systemic forms of justice you are considering in your work? If so, you could speak to how these forms of justice may show up. Can you speak to how these uh, forms of justice may show up online and in computing models? including the harm caused by the social media platforms and computational models. So not just harms that have come to individuals online, but harms that come to collective communities online. Has your work considered any of this and just for your general thoughts about that? Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you, William. Um, and, a, and a good critique too. One of the things I struggle with is, um, so agreeing with these points, um, first of all, there's an idea of transformative justice, which kind of takes restorative justice to a to a different level, um, and and I think transformative justice or kind of paths in that in that light would say that um, these social media companies, for example, platforms in themselves are harmful, and like a transformative justice approach would probably just say get rid of them and start over and have more community centered models. Um, and then, um, and I, so I, I don't even, I didn't try to kind of claim, let's like get to transformative justice. I don't know how to do that. And I, so, um, I do think that a, an important direction to, to think about with this work though, is things like, um, community harms, which we can imagine. And, and a challenge is just how would you do that? And what, again, what do you automate or not automate? But but certainly a lot of these harms are based on shared identities. Um, you know, the two examples I showed you are um, likely based on gender for both of them and, and race for Dr. Uche Blackstock. Um, so clearly those are group shared identities. And um, and I think I, I hesitate to answer because I don't know what kind of a, addressing a group harm would look like. I'd, like I'd love to talk about it more. If we go back to the fairness literature, so if you think about it as a tool cut, toolkit and we can learn from fairness. There's the individual kind of fairness and then there's group fairness, which does, is thinking about, you know, group harms. Um, and so we might still learn from those. And the only difference, kind of a, a more justice oriented framework would say is not only do you remove the group discrimination, but you also think about how do you repair the discrimination that has happened, say for groups. So um, I'd love to, move in that direction if i could imagine ways of doing it so this maybe this is kind of just not surprisingly for williams thinking about kind of what's next and, and where do we go with it and just for to give a specific example if we think about what could we automate well people have been repeatedly targeted harassed online those are things that like we should know sites can probably detect and figure out and so you can build those into models and say this person is perpetually harassed they're always reporting stuff like why don't we take on some responsibility to care for them more and to you know, think about justice for their experience online. Um, but then doing it for a group model gets pretty messy in terms of like assuming things about the race or gender or all that stuff. So um, maybe community oriented approaches, working with organizations seems like it, something one should do. I still don't know how that would address it, but it's a great question. Yeah, that seems, you know, the tricky component. I think we've, we've talked about in the context of Twitter before, right? So sort of you, you can't group people and understand what groups are in the same way um, using social media data. And I think that presents some challenges to what you're, you're discussing as well. But I, but I agree is an important framing. Um, individual harms versus collective harms and threats um, yeah. are quite different. Um, okay, our next question. Uh, is how would it be possible to truly quantify the amount of press, the amount of oppression that people face? I know it was discussed about which populations face the most targeted harassment, but it, but if she could speak more to that. So how do we know who's who's experiencing more or less oppression or harassment online, and is that 
I'm going to add to the question, is that important for us to quantify in order to inform our, our actions? Yeah, yeah, when, and the idea of quantifying oppression just has this knee-jerk reaction of, oh my God, no. <laughs> like, so um, even though it may be in fact kind of what I was pro not proposing, but kind of putting forth as a provocation, right? So as soon as we try to think about kind of measuring harms as well, we're quantifying them. Um, which that seems tricky, right? To repair, how can you repair harms without quantifying them in these kind of very automated, scaled up platforms um, without kind of just taking the transformative justice approach of like burn them all down and start over with new models where we can think about kind of what is interpersonal kind of relationships, you know, can we do these in, in more human centered ways, I guess. So, and maybe the word oppression is especially, concerning because it kind of indicates, uh, not that the um, Pranathi's question is concerning, but when, as I think through kind of what I don't want to suggest is um, like oppression Olympics where we're like now who's who's harmed most and like how do we rank kind of harms and supporting them. So we want to be careful about that. Um, so it's possible we could think about models and maybe this gets at William's question as well that invoke communities a little more. So I have um, some other lines of work that I didn't talk about as much, but to think about bystander and community responsibility when people are harmed online. So rather than just sites kind of implementing you know, apology or payment kind of frameworks, but what are people's, um, other people in the community's accountability for repairing those harms or observing them and seeing it's my, I need to do something about that. I need to step in. Like this is for on all of us, you know, one person's being harmed, we're all being harmed kind of a thing. So, so maybe that's a different kind of approach for not trying to quantify it, but it, instead saying that when something um, happens within a community, within this, whatever context it is, can we think about um, approaches that encourage other people to take on the responsibility? And that is something that you know sites could design in their in their interfaces, move away from the individualistic like individual experiences and say, kind of expose what other people's experiences look like and kind of increase this accountability. And this exists like this is something I think we don't do very well in most contexts, you know, and certainly in U.S. society where um, I think about sexual harassment or other kinds of contexts, you know, on or offline, like um, should be everyone's responsibility to to address and remediate harms someone might experience, but it's really not models that we're used to. So, so maybe that's, um, it's not about quantifying it, but it's when these things happen, how do people step up and remediate them in some way? Yeah, and I think it's, it's different to quantify something for the sake of comparison, to say more or less, this group is experiencing more or less, as opposed to trying to identify some threshold for action. Um, I, you know, I don't think those are necessarily the, the same sort of intentions in terms of why are you quantifying something. Yeah. Um, and quantifying harm also seems really different than quantifying threat. So did I intend to do harm is different than did I actually experience harm? And that might be very different for different people. But certainly even your intent to produce harm is something I'd like to be aware of, right? And so um, even that, that nuance might be um, important as well. Uh -huh. We have another question. Um, uh, as a lawyer, I'm delighted to hear that technologists are getting into social issues and issues of justice. For those of us who know nothing about technology, what can we do to contribute to this debate? How can we learn enough about the potential of technology to help develop meaningful strategies? Um, and just to add to this, I see this in two ways, right? You're talking about as a, as a um, technologist, as uh, someone on that side, what did you have to learn or what are you actively trying to learn about justice and equality and those sorts of things? And on the other side, uh, you know, how do people who don't really engage in the technology side of this really think about um, how they best engage um, and contribute to the conversation? That's a really good question. I think these are um, very interdisciplinary problems. Um, and so on the computing side, trying to kind of move into topics that are oriented around justice and what do they look like without um, collaborating with people who are, who have been thinking about these. So whether it's lawyers or humanities folks or um, social science training, you know, 
I think that's um, really important at this point. Um, and my own, so we have an NSF grant that's been kind of um, supporting some of this work that one of the co-PIs is a, a law professor here at U of M. So that's one way to kind of think about some of the legal perspectives. Um, the paper that I mentioned that's published on my website that looks at kind of preferred responses to um, social media are with is with uh, Oliver Hames and Lisa Nakamura, who are two colleagues who both study the internet from different perspectives with expertise in gender and race, um, which I thought was really important because that paper did try to think about those issues and um, and so having experts in various disciplines was important to that conversation. So, so that's coming from my side. As a lawyer, I mean, there's there's a lot of overlap now. So with things like fairness, it overlaps very closely with both the law and statistics about kind of like group fairness is a discrimination kind of anti-discrimination discrimination issue and it's also a statistical issue um so so we're seeing a lot of that intersection um like internet law folks would are would be ones who would deeply understand the law and the internet but i think that is such a huge debate so i would think about what topics within it are of interest to you so is it um like law is such a broad topic but um you know whatever the areas of expertise are, I think there's so many directions it could go. Um, I'm working with some collaborators now that where we're focusing on um, disability and online experiences where we have similar questions about what does justice look like for disability, which has different um, considerations um, for disabled people and they're using technology, they're experiencing um, online platforms. And so that's just one example where would think about well what does um disability law say about what are people's rights in offline contexts and so and then how do we think about where they are supported or fall short for the most part people, disabled people are kind of failed in terms of legal rights um online even just something like creating you know an accessible talk is difficult to do you have to create separate slides and things like that and it's really important to do that um so we don't see that happening so i think for a lawyer i'd say instead of trying to just kind of cover the whole field of technology, take an area of interest or area of expertise and think about what is the link between that area of expertise and what do we know about online environments and maybe look for a few people who are working in those spaces because it's such a broad field and I think there's a, a lot of overlap, especially if you think about identity and justice issues. Yeah, I think I think that's you know spot on, right? Thinking about the narrow focus that you can actually handle and manage and then you, the key collaborations um, it can be overwhelming to think that you're suddenly supposed to develop some new area of expertise um, and something you haven't been trained to do or consider or think about and so I think uh, those collaborations become deep meaningful collaborations right become really critical for, for doing work in this area um, for you, and, and we've been thinking about this a lot in social work, sort of how do we need to change the curriculum in social work to prepare social workers to be more familiar with these emerging technologies in particular so that they have basic competencies um, and understand how it may have implications for their work and um, the populations with, with, with whom they work. Um, how might you have changed your undergraduate curriculum? What What was missing for you in terms of the training that would have helped you move into this direction a little more easily or start to think about these intersections um, at the outset of your academic preparation um, as opposed to later? I think a critical perspective, which, so when I think about my engineering classes, it was often, and this was like in, you know, 2000, 98 to 2002 was when I was an undergrad, um, is very it was focused and at the time this felt like like i said like progressive to focus on helping people so that was kind of the this is how the engineering has the social side is we're going to help people um and then the the liberal arts side of um the classes i took didn't have a strong critical perspective so sociology um it was a traditional kind of sociology course so you're studying a bunch of traditional in the sense of like um, 
dead white scholars basically and so like you know and, and so um and so and, and that's i think it's just a reflection of this is a slow moving kind of um, vision to think about more critical perspectives so like the paper i mentioned um the critical race and hci paper that um, some colleagues wrote that i had on one of my slides um it does that work of trying to bring critical race theory in hci as it turns out um but those i don't feel like i either i didn't have exposure to those critical perspectives um or i didn't digest them but i'm pretty sure that there wasn't there wasn't that kind of reflection i think now that would be if it went back to you know that school or any other school so i think it's a you know we're seeing shifts towards that um so so yeah the, the word critical i'm on a committee now at the university of michigan where we're thinking about what does computing look like um in humanities and social science fields and things like that so there's a question of like what do students need to know who are not in like engineering or information um and i'm making a pitch for this critical computing idea because it's it does center the um, the humanities and other fields, which are not my expertise, but I try to learn from in these questions of what should computing look like. One of my favorite questions that the committee doesn't like, but I keep asking is, if we bring compute, like if we say computing has to be in humanities and social sciences, why are we not also demanding that humanities and social sciences are in computing curricula? Because that, then they say, wait, what? Like, so that would be my argument, you know, why? Why does it go one direction, not the other? Yeah, I, 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 I wince a little bit when I see engineering departments leading a humanities effort when there aren't any people who are engaged in the humanities or the social sciences or practice with communities involved, meaningfully involved with those projects. There are limits to our expertise. There's limits to our disciplinary trainings, especially the way that they're currently set up. And we have to be very careful about how we move into these spaces. Um, we potentially will perpetuate um, additional harms um, if we, even, even with our best intentions, if we haven't um, integrated um, the, the right team that we need to, to get this kind of work well, done. While feeling good about being socially good or whatever. I've done something good and yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, good intentions are insufficient. That should definitely be a takeaway point. Um, so yeah. what do you do beyond that? Um, we have time, well, I think we're kind of, well, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, do you think new legislation is needed for big tech companies to address fairness and justice on their platforms? Are there internal motivations and incentives for these companies? To, are there internal motivations and incentives for these companies to center these issues? This is a great question. It's one that centered in, you know, just this week there was a, um, a panel on section 230 which is like the code that kind of governs what internet companies have to do or not um, in terms of protecting users so i used to be more of an advocate for regulation because it seemed to me to be like something that was needed to you know we're going to protect people and help them um, it seems clear that's the main reason that's harmful is because the big tech companies like facebook and google can afford to comply their way into regulation and it'll just kill all the smaller companies that can't afford to it to do it right so it's not that it's necessarily going to make them better it's just going to be a legal roadblock that costs a lot of money to get past and therefore you continue and it actually might just um, make things worse so um so what is the answer you know i don't know it seems like some of the more successful um directions are internal organizing and activism within companies so google when they're um partnering with you know, dod or doing other kinds of defense stuff sometimes googlers have walked out and said we're not doing this facebook has been speaking out about um i think race and other um topics in recent weeks i think there's lots of internal tensions right now and these are hard conversations but it seems like at least within companies there's some power to to shift conversations and to work with um, the media right so public outcry i mean people walk with their feet so it's hard these companies are so big that it seems hard for them to fail but so far it seems like these have some some traction and maybe that also gets at william's question about individual versus kind of collective efforts um yeah, yeah. well thank you dr shanevek for joining us we really appreciate you please join me in uh thanking um dr shanevek for being here and taking time to 
provocate. <laughs> yes, me. thanks so much for having me and for <laughs> um, the conversation. Thinking about this in careful and thoughtful ways. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you everyone okay. for, for taking time for yet another Zoom meeting, but this was very, very, a uh, very useful uh, use of our time. And this is Bruce Pogut, who's our co-chair of the Computational Social Science Group. So thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you.